Well, I'll, I'll get started then. Um, first of all, a very warm welcome from me as well. And Nathan, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thank you also all for coming to today's presentation. Uh, I should state uh, that I'm really sincerely very grateful for both the invite from Plymouth uh, and the chance to speak to you today about this important topic. Uh, also, since we're recording this, I have to say uh, that I'm also very, very grateful to our law enforcement. Uh, some of the public cases that, that you'll see are relayed from them. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful to all law enforcement personnel that I've met throughout this research and on other topics that, that we're looking into. Now, as you'll be able to tell from the title itself, it's, it's without a doubt a critical topic. And sadly, it remains at the extreme end of the spectrum of cyber criminality. Uh, online child sexual exploitation involves a series of, of serious offenses, and in most cases, it involves the exchange of child pornographic material online. But it can also be connected to physical crimes like rape, kidnap, and child trafficking. It involves various stages that are connected to different digital elements. Now, while it is difficult within the space of 45 minutes to show you how deep the rabbit hole goes, I will try to highlight the key challenges around this phenomenon and also try to offer a rather high level overview of the phenomenon and the cyber related challenges that are faced within it. Um, I should also mention up front that this talk is, in no, is not in any way a substitute for the academic paper uh, that's, that I'll reference later on. Uh, the paper uh, contains far more organized detail on both the enabling and constraining affordances that showcase how technology is used and misused, and also how technology is misperceived. Now, a few fundamental working assumptions that we can reflect on underscore the fact that this is a multidimensional problem. First of all, it's a global, digital Cyber, cyber criminal phenomenon. The internet has allowed pedophiles to find one another and form more complex rings of online criminality with significant real world extensions. It is also a critical crime that affects children at a very vulnerable stage of their lives. And sadly, the victims that are being targeted are getting younger and younger as digital devices become part of children's daily lives from a very early stage of their development. For many, a digital life is the life that they know, and children can become vulnerable regardless of their location. In order to deal with online child sexual exploitation, many stakeholders require serious cooperation, uh, law enforcement, government agencies, sometimes intelligence agencies, schools, telecoms providers, local councils, and many more need to cooperate within, with a genuine interest to make improvements where they can. Also, as we shall see, um, cyber awareness is absolutely fundamental and critical in preventing cases. This is even more important as detecting and pursuing cases faces a number of significant obstacles. So investing and working on digital strategies for the prevention and, and for the creation of and construction of cyber awareness in this space, as well as in promoting online safety, is always a reasonable strategy. Now, there are many, many lessons that we can reflect upon, and so I will dive right in. Before I go into some of the more academic detail about the phenomenon itself, I thought it, it would makes sense to start with a real case. Um, and that's the case of Robin Tavares. I should say that this is not an atypical case, but it does have some characteristics that can help us reflect on a wider number of cases. The case begins in November 2019, when an IP address is spotted downloading and uploading child sexual exploitation material on BitTorrent a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing platform. This was already known 
pornographic material that was previously identified as child pornography and the exchange of that material constitutes the overwhelming majority of traffic uh, on online child sexual exploitation. It is, of course, an offense in itself, but the complications begin once an investigation starts. Through the IP address of the individual and with an order to uncover his physical address, the police managed to identify the location of the suspect, um, as well as the suspect himself, aged 37, as Robin Tavares, a resident of Hull. They confiscate all of the digital devices that they can find, and they take them to the digital forensics lab of our local law enforcement agency. Uh, this is an added complication, of course, that many investigations face, because in the past, confiscating digital data would imply seizing one or two devices. But these days, police have to confiscate laptops, mobile phones, tablets, cameras, external devices, USB sticks, SD cards, and the list goes on and on and on. So the volume of data that needs to be handled and analyzed escalates quickly. Multiply that to dozens of suspects or hundreds of suspects, and you quickly get terabytes of data that need to be investigated in detail. And even though specialist software is, of course, being used in digital forensics investigations, several problems can emerge because of the volume. In the case of this suspect, the extracted data from the devices went through a triage process to check whether the case should be prioritized. And in that process, the police discovered that data contained first generation imagery. This makes the case a top priority as first generation images are, and this is a critical concept in online child sexual exploitation, first generation images are effectively pornographic images of children that are new cases and quite possibly ongoing cases of exploitation, or else the police has not seen these images before. How do they know this and how can they tell the difference? Well, previous cases of child pornography that have been uh, investigated are already catalogued in a unique database. This database is known as CAID, the Child Abuse Image Database, which was created in 2014 by the Home Office. This database contains a digital fingerprint, a fast value effectively, of all known previously trafficked and evaluated images of child pornography. So when a potential suspect like Tavares is exchanging child pornographic material with someone else, the police can check whether these are previous cases that have already been investigated or whether we might have new potential victims. Just to give you an idea of the scale of the phenomenon, uh, 16.5 million unique images of child pornography are contained in the database. That's a pretty old estimate. The current projection is closer to 25 million images that have been hashed. These increase by a quarter of a million per month. Um, about 850 arrests per month are done in the UK and more than a thousand children are safeguarded per month. So when the analysis on the data from the suspect of Tavares took place, the police were able to confirm that two children under the age of 13 were raped, one boy and one girl. One was a five-year-old. And as the police were wearing body cameras when they entered the scene of the property, they could take high-quality photographs of the different rooms and the, and the bedroom where the recordings had taken place. By conducting further image recognition and analysis and checking whether the surrounding room as a landscape, as a background architectural space and bedroom appeared in other photographs, they were able to identify and find two additional victims, 
one of which was out of the country at the time of investigation and required the assistance of Interpol. Meanwhile, a large volume of additional child pornographic material was discovered involving 1,800 images of what is known as Category A images. That's the most serious category that involves penetrative sexual activities or images involving sexual activity uh, or sadism. An additional 197 Category A images were created by Tavares himself in the process of sexually abusing children. In September 2020, Tavares pleaded guilty to a total of 20 offenses, but since he was further, uh, since then, he was actually further arrested while in prison for an additional 18 charges. Uh, meanwhile, um, so. Sorry, I'm getting some, yep, they were thinking, Nathan. Uh, so meanwhile, due to the um, sheer volume of data and the number of images involved, there are more victims that have not been identified yet. And the volume of data and the investigative process surrounding them can be very complex indeed. So uh, even though the virus is, is being locked up for 22 years in prison, the search for identifying the victims can continue because of the, both the digital forensics investigations in place, but mostly because of the investigative work that has to go into the identification of um, the, the victims. Now, while the case of Tavares is a single case, there are suddenly many, many, many more cases like this. Also, as the internet and parts of it, like the dark web, have allowed for a more tight interconnectivity, they have essentially virtualized the planet. They have virtualized criminality, allowing pedophiles to find one another digitally and to construct more horrible variations of child sexual exploitation. I should say that originally my academic interest was not to do research on online child sexual exploitation. In fact, in my earlier discussions with police, um, with, with our police, and also with law enforcement in the United States, I was looking more broadly at the mechanisms of technological exploitation in, in social networks for online criminal businesses, including fraud and money laundering, as well as cryptocurrency-based cyber money laundering, which is what some of my own PhD students are currently exploring. However, after speaking to a good friend and colleague of mine from our digital forensics team, he mentioned something that I still find incredibly disturbing and startling, that from all the cybercrime cases that the entire digital forensics team is dealing with, online child sexual exploitation accounts for about 95% of all the cases. All of the other crimes that have a digital element and end up in digital forensics is just the remaining 5%. Of course, that can fluctuate based on the regions, and, but it's, it's roughly, this is roughly what it's looking like in terms of significance and, and volume. Put differently, the online child sexual exploitation of cases is a digital pandemic. However, unlike COVID that seems to have subsided, the digital vaccines that we need as a global community to protect our children from these horrific crimes are not as well advanced. It really is the perfect tsunami of digital exploitation. For cyber criminals, there is no better environment to operate in a world full of children that have been addicted to digital social media, accustomed to digital interactions, and trading online privacy for convenience. Parents also share a great deal of this responsibility, but we'll come to this later. So, that sets the scene uh, into what started for me as a research project. 
as quite reluctantly, about seven years ago, I started doing research on this topic, a uh, research that culminated with the publication of a journal article on online child sexual exploitation from an information systems management perspective and published at the Journal of the Association for Information Systems. Um, you've got the reference there and the uh, URL as well as the um, the DOI for uh, identifying the, the download. And also, if you'd like a copy, just send me an email. But Nathan also has a copy, so I'm happy for him uh, to, dis to disseminate uh, within this group. Now, in, in what follows, I will describe some of the fundamental characteristics of the process and, and some of our key findings uh, from this research. Now, when I started looking at the phenomenon, I effectively split up the data collection process into two stages. Uh, in phase one, cases available from the FBI were used, and these were cases that the FBI had investigated, but that the offenders were already prosecuted and sentenced and the description of what they did was actually publicly available data in press releases that were pretty detailed from the Department of Justice. Uh, here you can see just one sample description. By collecting a large number of these cases, we started to get a better understanding of what was going on in online child sexual exploitation and how technology was involved in constructing the phenomenon as well as how offenders use the technology. In the second phase of the research, I looked into further data from the UK, mostly by interviewing experts from cybercrime and digital forensics teams, uh, from the UK Safer Internet Organization, from other police staff, and also um, having an ongoing participation into a safeguarding children's board at the level of local government for a period of about two and a half, three years. We also did a, a six hour workshop uh, on online child safety involving 21 participants and additional interviews followed through that. It's also quite important for me to clarify that at no point I ever had access to or saw any child imagery during the research, but speaking to experts that were reviewing such cases, I got a good sense of the real psychological pressure that they're facing. And this perhaps opens up some interesting pathways for research and development in computer science as well, particularly in how user, user computer interfaces, as well as behavioral analytics in human computer interactions can be capturing indicators during the investigative part that can support investigators or in, in more advanced forms uh, of image classifications, for example, uh, we can alleviate manual classification of, of imagery um, through uh, image recognition. Uh, we can come back at this point. Um, now, the collection of the more detailed press releases from the FBI cases and the Department of Justice also helped in painting a, a picture of the structural characteristics of the phenomenon. So a number of codes were used in those cases, but ultimately the conceptual framework that we developed had a higher degree of abstraction. From the FBI cases, a number of aspects emerged. In almost all cases, a proxy identity is being used and is being created to establish contact with the victims, something that you would expect as the offenders are also trying to optimize and safeguard the, their own, um, you know, or lower their own probability of detection and identification. The behavior of young users is sadly considered to be, and it is um, a significant part of the problem, of course, through no fault of their own. However, the general apathy towards privacy does play into the dynamics of the phenomenon. This apathy is reinforced in different ways. So while parental controls in mobile devices and filtering are useful, 
they tend to be bypassed with the consent of parents, much like age thresholds to join social networks. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, for example, require everyone to be at least 13 years old to join. The reality is very different. Age verification is limited. And this level of persistent interaction within social networks creates this progressive desensitization of, of privacy. So digital parenting requires the development of new privacy-enhanced technologies, privacy-enhanced mechanisms, and again, cyber awareness that comes at the front. But at the core of the phenomenon is the generation, recirculation, and reliance on child pornographic images. We will get to this point because there are several complications in this. Beyond simple image recognition or image hashing techniques, there might be also further interesting possibilities for research here, and, and we can talk a, a little bit about this in the Q&A perhaps. Time is also significant. Within a brief time frame, one victim can yield for the perpetrators a large amount of pornographic imagery. For example, we saw a case being reported of a 13-year-old that had uploaded 600 nude photographs of herself into a Dropbox account that was controlled by the offender while the offender was using the same photographs to develop proxy identities to attract further victims. Thus, the centrality of uh, pornographic imagery is also the basis of the relationship between the early stages of online child exploitation. So, pedophiles need nude photographs of children to convince other potential victims of their proxy identities so that they can get the new victims to produce more nude photographs and so on. It is a vicious cycle. This creates a unique recursive and self-referential phenomenon. If you like, it is, this is some peculiar form of a digital topology that is akin metaphorically to the mathematical construction of a Klein bottle, or in systems theoretical terms, a self-referential digital system that exhibits a unique form of re-entry. How does that work? Well, once a current victim enters the zone of online child sexual exploitation criminality, then the digital exploitation of their data constitutes both or actually contributes towards both the expansion of the phenomenon and it creates a stronger field of pulling potential future victims. So the temporal, the computational, as well as the privacy and security related challenges here signal some kind of digital inflation of the phenomenon from within. It is quite an irony, really, that the pornographic material extracted from previous victims helps to victimize new children. Uh, so offenders effectively become brokers in the continuous re-victimization of children through the digital space. This is because offenders will use previously collected child pornography in order to pretend that they are a child and lower the barrier of the victim's perceived privacy. After all, if the other supposed child is sending me nude photographs, I might as well send some of my own back. This is the mentality in the digital space. This dynamic is one of the mechanisms that regenerates and sustains the broader system. Other expansion tends to fuel the system as well. Uh, child pornography is now stored across multiple devices, PCs, laptops, mobile phones, SD cards, on the cloud. Um, so creating even more challenges like cloud-based digital forensics. Encryption is another. So while Facebook and many other of the popular uh, social networks are being used, 
this is a very dynamic environment with every technology being exploited in variable ways. So the activity of offenders and networking also seems to be increasing in sophistication and possibilities for exploitation. So how do offenders operate? From the multiple dimensions we registered for online CSC, uh, four distinct stages can be distinguished. In the first stage, offenders will use technology to establish communication between offender and victim. This has never been easier for offenders because with a variety of social networks, platforms, online games, as well as the ease of use through which proxy identities can be set up, establishing communication is easy. At stage two, technology is used in different ways for creating trust between offender and victim. Geographic location, for example, can be manipulated to create a sense of familiarity. And there are various trust techniques deployed there. For example, being a new kid in town, pretending to be someone famous. We even saw a case where an offender pretended to be Justin Bieber, uh, giving away free concert tickets and wanted to get to know the victims. Anything that you can possibly imagine can and does happen at this stage. Offenders also tend to offer sexualized or pornographic imagery first so that they can establish trust. And this is either original imagery from previous victims or digitally manipulated pornography. Furthermore, they also tend to be very persistent over significant periods of time. For example, we had the case of an 11-year-old that received more than 1,200 messages and emails from the offender in order to gain uh, the child's trust. And once that happens at stage three, online extortion begins. Offenders will make all sorts of threats and often post softer material online of the victims so that the victims are convinced of their ill intent. If geolocation data is compromised um, and the location of the victims have also been found by the offenders, serious extortion threats can be made. For example, children are being told that if they do not comply with their demands, their family members will be killed, or they themselves will be harmed, or their reputation will be destroyed. And this kind of pressure, of course, is very, very difficult for an adult to handle. But for a child that has already been exploited, it is almost an impossible situation to be in. It is unbearable, which is why many children do not seek help at the early stages of extortion. At the fourth stage, Online trafficking acquires market characteristics. Pedophiles exchange online pornography through social networks, the dark web, as well as elite proprietary networks. However, many of these elite networks are like private clubs. And in order to join some of them, offenders require a certain number of child images as buy-in tokens. This is their contribution to the club. I've got to say that I was even told of networks that, were, that required 10,000 pornographic images as an entry portfolio so that an, an aspiring pedophile can be welcomed into the digital elite network. This raises an important question and motivation for them as well. How do they enrich their collections of child imagery online so that they can join these elite pornographic clubs? The sources, sadly, are plenty. For example, some oversharing parents post plenty of photographs of their children online without knowing that these, fo these photographs are downloaded, manipulated, and photoshopped to be made to look pornographic. These then become part of the buy-in portfolio of pedophiles. Sadly, on top 
of all of the problems in this area, such images are also contributing to the volume of data, making it more difficult for the police to prioritize first generation imagery, the imagery that is deemed to be of higher risk. Then offenders exchange pornography between themselves through different online tools, often by monetizing them. They also receive imagery from victims that they extort online or more broadly manipulate photographs from other web-based sources. For some, this is huge business. Uh, in some ways, it is a business like no other, but in some other ways that acquire market characteristics, it is a business like any other. More specifically, it is an online business in that it seeks to value or to impose value on online exchanges. These are tokenized through the procurement of online imagery of children. So it is in this context <clears throat> that child pornographic imagery is actually perceived as an online currency, with some <clears throat> trying to monetize it for bitcoins, or for example. It is also a global market. Put differently, child pornographic imagery is seen as online money tokens. The closer the underground markets have come to this was in the case of Richard Hackel, who abused over 200 children in Malaysia. Hackel, in some cases, was broadcasting the rapes of young children online while he had created a community online for pedophiles that operated like an online game. To stay in the game, the abusers competed for an online token that they called PedoPoint. The more children that they raped and abused, the more PedoPoints they collected. Or else, Hackle had effectively gamified online child sexual exploitation. In another case, another strange variant occurred digitally involving inside country reverse trafficking of children. This is a very peculiar form where instead of trafficking the child, they trafficked the offenders or else different offenders that met digitally were invited to travel to a single location where a vulnerable child was raped repeatedly by different offenders. Detectives were able to identify and arrest 11 UK suspects and rescued 24 children. One offender got up at 4 a.m. in the morning to cross the country to abuse a child before driving home and making it to work on time. As the reporting of the story disclosed, um, the, um, the case was shocking in a number of ways that involved this group, and one baby was raped and sexually abused by three of the gang over nine months. The others watched on live internet feeds. The groups had met and organized through adult chat websites and several social media websites where they were discussing these things in between them. In the paper, we, there was also, uh, we also mentioned an example of how offenders can use coded language so that they can escape the computational detection of keyword filtering or alert systems. Naturally, while these are deeply sickening acts, they also teach us an important lesson. At this extreme end of cyber and real criminality, offenders will stop at nothing. So when we were previously talking about the need to, have a, uh, to create a portfolio of images through which they access elite pornographic clubs, that means that they target anything that is literally available with an image of a child. Ironically and paradoxically, another source for sexualizing images of children are schools. So a number of pornographic images of children are actually school harvested and edited. 
For example, innocent photographs of children were taken from a school in Glasgow um, and were found on a Russian pedophile website alongside sexualized comments. Glasgow City Council, as well as Stirling Council, urged the schools to take better safety precautions. The site, run from the city of St. Petersburg, was described by US law enforcement as popular for trading child pornography. I've got to say that from a small online experiment that we ran briefly um, in our region, the Twitter accounts of only 10 schools contained in excess of 7,500 images of children, with the overall volume being more significant. In many cases, children were holding certificates with personally identifiable information posted by the school itself. Why? Is there really a need for that? This should make us question whether school themselves, schools themselves open the digital door of unwittingly cultivating digital apathy and apathy towards online privacy. Think of it like this. Children and parents, as well as teachers and other stakeholders, stand in a dimly lit room with a large open door in the background. Where they are at the moment, privacy is ensured. But this large open door leads to a common digital space, a world of interconnectivity. Slowly but most certainly, children become desensitized towards their own online privacy. They go through that door and they never look back again. They share their photographs, they share their location, and they share themselves, all without a second thought. Social media is their digital anesthetic, the digital light that is attractive. But who pushes children towards that door without an understanding of what is on the other side? Who carries the dominant responsibility for this staggering escalation of such a vile phenomenon? This is an open question. However, the dynamics of online CSE in between the apathy for privacy the brokering of digital identities, uh, how pornographic imagery is trafficked, and the broader market dynamics, dynamics create an explosive mix. Admittedly, law enforcement are doing their level best to tackle this problem, and in our research paper, we categorize all these possibilities in detail. Here, I will simply mention them in brief. In each stage, the red part within represents the offenders and the green part outside of that, law enforcement. So in stage one, which is what we saw previously, where offenders initiate contact with victims with through web applications, social networks, and using real and fake imagery for their proxy identities, cybercrime teams use undercover agents and impersonate children trying to lure the offenders. In stage two, where offenders spend a lot of time developing trust, police are trying to monitor networks and prioritize images while pursuing offenders in the event that the offenders divulge pornographic images first. In stage three, where online extortion occurs through social networks and images are solicited by victims, police try to conduct keyword monitoring and filtering of conversations and of course, investigate reported threats and images where possible. Some of these monitoring techniques are not too dissimilar from those used in counterterrorism, but monitoring networks for suspicious activity uh, sadly, and of course, encounters the all-time classic problem of false positives. Naturally, this has also significant implications for investigative work. In stage four, Police try to infiltrate networks of trafficking, monitor exchanges, and attempt to figure out differences between first and second generation images. Some technologies that are used in this context are really helping out, like photo DNA uh, donated by Microsoft. There's also interesting scope here in the horizon with the advancement of um, LLMs, 
large language models with added layers of abstraction and dedicated training that can possibly function as police deployed deployed chatbots to attract potential offenders and discuss autonomously with them over time. But even with all these countermeasures in place, it is an uphill battle and the phenomenon requires global support and collaborative engagement. It also raises the criticality of cyber awareness. Now that is easier said than done. Everyone has a role to play in this. Uh, parents, schools, law enforcement, local councils, health services, and the public and the private sector more widely with important cyber awareness campaigns. But it is not an easy set of circumstances. Nowadays, children sense the world through technology. They have anxiety by peer pressure and feel the need to always be collect connected. They seek digital validation and their need for digital likes, whether that's on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat and TikTok, whatever, becomes so dominant that it constructs neurophysiologically an alternate reflection of themselves. So the digital self that they come to construct is perceived as a both distant and proximal entity. Do not underestimate the need of children to feel validated online and the consequences of suppressing their privacy because of that. Entire secondary markets have evolved around this. For example, in an era of online influencers where privacy goes out of the window, the pressure to become popular can even lead children to online services where they can buy Facebook friends, for example. Similar services exist for almost all major social networks. Once an order is placed, friends are normally delivered between 48 and 72 hours, unless someone selects the premium package um, where you can order 3,000 friends and one and a half thousand Facebook post likes as a free combo that can be delivered in between one and three weeks. The orders are placed by mobile farms, a grid of form, forms that are controlled with custom software, each of which operates a different Facebook account in order to avoid suspicions for detecting anomalous patterns of friend purchasing. In an era of influencers and online domination, where technology has literally infiltrated daily lives, it becomes harder to establish cyber awareness on phenomena like this, and even harder to convince children that there could be real world implications for their online behavior. This is not to say, of course, that it is only children that need to be educated all stakeholders require digital vaccines and a strong dose of cyber awareness. And even perhaps, and more specifically, major businesses uh, that can participate in child protection in the digital age have not yet realized the gravity of their responsibilities. So it's not just tech companies, because there is a broader ecosystem of interactions digitally and online. And in some cases, because of the online market characteristics that we have here, there are additional responsibilities by other key stakeholders. A prime example here is a financial institution. A bank in Australia, Westpac, a major financial institution, paid an 1.3 billion dollar fine after breaching the law across 23 million transactions by allowing small wire transfers that were consistent with child sexual exploitation to be executed. Essentially, the bank facilitated and allowed for the continuation of the funding of child abuse through 23 million transactions that went undetected. Now, um, the volume of transactions, of course, presents 
complication, but this is something that could have been detected. Uh, my own PhD is on financial crime and anti-money laundering, and I've seen the complications of the deployments of transaction monitoring systems in financial institutions, as well as the complications of the um, so the propagation of suspicious activity reports and the very large rates of false positives. Still, tech companies and financial institutions and many other key stakeholders are and have a significant role to play. Now, as I'm, as I'm about to bring the talk to a close in a few minutes, I have potentially one additional complication to discuss uh, briefly, one that will require both considerable reflection and good planning and cyber awareness strategies to handle as we enter in this interesting uh, world of artificial intelligence where we can have synthetic humans. These are effectively constituting synthetic identities that exist in no other level, yet they are digitally real. This child, for example, does not exist. Um, similarly, this child does not exist either, and neither does this one. Uh, so this creates the possibility of having an almost infinite tapestry of AI-generated children and, in turn, AI-constructed child pornography. Now, once that is harnessed by computationally savvy pedophiles, the ability to flood the underground markets with AI child pornography will emerge. The knock-on effect in some future investigations is that we might not be able to tell and figure out whether a child is real or AI generated. Um, if we do encounter that problem, and if that problem intensifies, then the volume of potential cases can become staggering. But if we cannot differentiate easily whether a child is real or AI generated, much like now, we cannot easily differentiate whether an essay is written by a human or chat GPT. Then this means that valuable police resources, resources that are absolutely and completely stretched thin, will become even more pressed. It might become exponentially more difficult to protect real children if the AI-generated ones end up consuming investigative resources. In this developing ecosystem of digital and real exploitation, cyber awareness uh, and um, the broader digital initiatives that we can undertake in order to enhance privacy in order to enhance cyber awareness become absolutely fundamental and they also become uh, they, they also sort of bring up a tangible barrier that um, we can have real and down-to-earth results on that final thought uh, i hope i haven't depressed you completely but on the contrary i hope that i have I've given you some thought about new lines of research, um, new potential initiatives, um, and new ideas for collaborating with our police officers, um, and possibly some incentive to uh, look into this phenomenon from different perspectives, whether that's AI or computational image classifications or chatbots uh, or whatever different angle. Um, it is an under research phenomenon uh, in, in many ways. But on that final thought, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. You've got my contact details there, so feel free uh, to reach out for any comment or feedback, uh, or if you would simply like a copy of the paper. So thank you very, very much. Nathan, back to you.